Bruchem Aboyim, and thank you very much for coming. Um, today's lecture on my thoughts will be a, a continuation again on Purim. And just to catch up, uh, again for those who may not uh, have heard the first lecture, uh, we began the story of Purim again with um, Akashverosh throwing a party on the third year of his reign, celebrating the fact the temple would not be rebuilt. And uh, in fact, he had stopped the construction. And during that party, again, he uh, executes he, uh, Vashti, the queen. Uh, that causes a uh, Esther to become uh, at the beauty, par beauty pageant, and she's chosen to be the queen. So that's, again, just to catch up real quickly on thing. Again, if you get a chance, if you haven't heard it, please go back and listen to it. You can catch it on uh, YouTube and or on my website. So we pick up the story. Again, it's Purim. Poor him is what we're calling the lecture, second lecture mm -hmm. on it. We pick up the story nine years, nine years later. So Esther is still the queen, and Akashverosh has uh, still not been able to determine her family or nationality. Haman is elevated to the position of viceroy, second only to the king. The king orders that all citizens should bow down before Haman. Mordecai, the Jew, sees Haman and does not bow down before him, and this incenses Haman. He decides to make Mordecai and all of his people pay for Mordecai's disrespect. He makes a poor uh, word for lottery to ascertain which would be the best day to terminate all the Jews, all the Jews in the Persian Empire. It fell out on the 13th of the Hebrew month of Adar. He thought the timing was perfect, since somehow he knew that Moshe, our Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, died on the 7th of Adar. What he didn't know, I guess he must have left early, was Moshe had also been born on that very same day. A totally complete life. There's another connection to the month of Adar. The Megillah tells that Haman offered the king Akashverosh 10,000 talents of silver for the right to kill out all the Jews. The king, who was even an even greater anti-Semite than Haman, told him he could exterminate the Jews for free. He told him to keep his money poetic justice. When it came time to build the second tem tem temple, these same 10,000 talents of silver which were seized from Homa's estate, Achashverosh gave to Esther, who gave it to Mordechai, who then gave it to Ezra, and these funds were used to construct the second temple. <laughs> so it was Homa's money that actually financed the building of the second temple. In addition, God always brings the cure before he brings the sickness. In this month, of Adar, the Torah commands all Jews to donate a ha half shekel. This money is to be used for the communal sacrifices in the temple for that year. The total amount that the Jewish men ages 20 to 60 had donated was 10,000 talents of silver up to that time. God, so to speak, said to Haman, you evil person, my children have already preempted your 10,000 talents with the half shekel of their own. We see the connection between the two sons of Rachel, Yosef and Binyamin. Both Yosef and Binyamin's descendant, Mordechai, were viceroys to the superpower on the world at that time. Yosef was instrumental in saving his family from death, and so too Mordechai was able to be instrumental in saving the entire nation from extermination. We read in the Torah that when Binyamin was in Egypt, Yosef had given him five changes of clothing. This was an allusion to the five royal garments that Mordechai, Binyamin's descendant, would wear in his position as second to the king, Achashverosh. We read in the second book of the Torah in the portion of Yisro, 1910, that before God gave the Torah to the Jews on Mount Sinai, he told Moshe to tell the people to sanctify themselves by separating from their wives for two days. When Moshe told the people on his own, he added an additional day and told them to separate for three days. We see that when Esther says that she will go and seek an audience with the king, she tells Mordechai to have all the Jews in Shushan fast for three days. Nowhere else in Torah do we find any mention of a three-day fast or separation before an event. Both of these events were connected to a spiritual sanctity in an acceptance of the Torah. At the giving of the Torah, Rashi says in the portion of Yisro 
that God held a mountain over their heads like a barrel. And he said to them, Accept the Torah or here you shall die. The commentaries question the statement. After all, without any coercion, they had already said the words, Na'aseh v'nishma, we will do and then we will listen. That being the case, why would God have to threaten them to accept? So there are different answers that are given. One answer is that the mountain at the giving of the Torah was all covered in fire, flashes of lightning, sounds of thunder, heavenly angels, God speaking directly to them. The whole experience was otherworldly, and it scared them literally to death. In fact, there's a measure that says that they actually did die twice. Once, after hearing each of the first two commandments. Then God had to revive them with the do, the revival of the dead. This is one of the reasons that Moshe's presence was so important to them. They needed an intermediary, someone that would talk to God for them. Dying and being resurrected again and again, well, that was more than they could handle. They felt pangs of insecurity. Other commentaries say that they accepted the Torah initially. When they did, it was only the written Torah, not the oral. Now this connects with the story of Purim. Our sages tell us that on Purim, Kiblu Mashikimu Kabar, that the whole Jewish nation reaffirmed that which they had accepted before. The fact was made evident by the addition of Megillat Esther as one of the 24 holy books of the Torah that we refer to as Tanakh, which is an acronym for the five books of the Torah, the eight books of the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the 11 books of Ksuvim, the writings. Not only was the book itself accepted by all, but in addition, all the laws connected with the observance of the holiday were also accepted universally. Another connection to the Jews and the receiving of the Torah. When Mordechai tells Esther to go to king, and plead for the survival of her people. She says to him that one was not permitted to just walk in and see the king. Court, court protocol stated that if one entered without an invitation and the king did not extend his scepter for them to touch, they were immediately taken out and executed. She told him that she had not been summoned by the king for 30 days. She said entering his chamber could very well cost her her life. But why? After all, she was the queen. Why should she be so concerned that he might have her executed? Also, why did she mention a specific time, 30 days? Why not just a while? I think that her response to Mordecai may have well been a veiled message. In the Jewish laws of mourning, a husband mourns for his wife for 30 days. She may have been intimating to Mordechai that Akashverosh had already mourned the 30 days for her death. Now, in the old world, one of the most important duties of a queen was to sire an heir. If a queen could not bear the king a son, her life was in jeopardy. Esther had been married to Akashverosh for about five years. There was no mention of a child. When she mentioned that she had not been called for 30 days, it was not a random number. It was the responsibility of the servants to monitor a queen to as to ascertain when she would menstruate. They would then report back to the king so that he would be certain to have relations with her during her fertile time. If she had not been called for 30 days, hmm, that meant that Akashverus had given up on her giving him an heir. So this may have been why she was concerned about her safety when she sent her message to Mordecai. She felt that this, was, this intrusion might well give the king the excuse that he needed to execute her and marry another woman instead. So we see that at first glance, her concern is all about herself. But then, when she realizes the magnitude of the situation, her personal concerns disappear. She's well aware that her attempt is to appeal to the king for a nation could very well cost her her life. She was ready. She needed a strategy, though. Some sort of plan. Fasting for three days <laughs> would not seem to be the best choice for her to make. She was going to the king, hoping to arouse and reunite his desire and passion for her. Think of it. If the average woman 
would have been in her position, what would they do? They would have spent the next three days at the spa, beautifying themselves, not fasting. She must have looked physically drawn and sickly. What we see happening in the story is that Esther had reached the highest level that a Jew can attain. She had resigned herself to do whatever was necessary, even giving up her life, to try and save her people. She had totally given herself over to God Almighty. She rejected the spas of earth and chose instead to enter into the sanctity of heaven. Physically, she was weak, but spiritually, uh, she was a force to be reckoned with. Truth is, she could barely hold herself up as she stood before the king. According to the Talmud in Megillah 15b, she was so weak that an angel was sent to stretch out the gold scepter for Akashverish for her to touch. Strangely enough, seeing her drawn and emaciated after a three-day fast may have and did <laughs> evoke the king's compassion towards her. What could have easily been a negative turned out to be exactly what was needed. She was truly godly inspired. At this point in the story, she has given herself over completely to God. The godly inspiration continued, and she invited the king and Haman to a party that night. All the pieces were fitting into place, just as God had planned. A lesson for us to learn, sometimes. We just need to be patient and let God do his miracles. In reality, even Ahasuerus may not have been aware that he'd extended his scepter to her. She had accepted upon herself whatever God ordained, even if it meant death or even worse, total submission to an evil person. She had reached the highest level of spirituality. Her inner sanctity radiated in a way that totally captivated the king. Yes, it was the king that extended his scepter, the king of kings, the power of good over evil. She came armed with another special merit. When Mordecai uncovered the plot to assassinate the king, he told Esther. She related the information to the king in the name of Mordecai. And due to his information, they were able to foil the attempt on the king's life. We are told by our sages that the reward for passing something on in the name of the person who said it is so powerful that it has the ability to bring the Messiah. And this is one of the reasons that many speakers, such as myself, end with the hope that the Messiah will come shortly. They may have said something without mentioning the author. Mordecai was not only Esther's uncle. The sages tell us that Esther's father died before her birth and her mother died during childbirth. She was raised by Mordecai. He mentored her all her life. In fact, there's a medrash that states that he had even married her. It was hard, very hard, even for him, a righteous prophet of God, to understand why she had been chosen to be the queen of the Persian Empire. However, as the story unfolds, Mordecai says to her, when she seems to hesitate for a moment about her mission, who knows whether it was just for such a time as this that you were attained the royal position. As it says in Pirkei Obot, Hillel said, Im enani li mi li. I am not for myself. Who will be for me? We are all born with a mission that only we can fulfill. Esther responds to Mordecai's words with a request that all the Jews in Shushan should fast for three full days and that she and her maidens would do the same. At the end of the fast, she would then present herself before the king. She adds the words at the end, Ka'asher avadati avadati. And if I perish, I perish. She repeats the words of vadati twice. Perish. Why? The word of vadati, perish, can be broken up into two words. Avad means that it was destroyed. Taf Yud, 410, after 410 years. Alluding to the first temple that stood for 410 years. She repeats her words because we always connect our pain and suffering to our temples that were destroyed. We don't forget our past. One has to wonder, what was it about Esther that was so special, so unique, that Ahasuerus chose her to be his queen? Well, she was beautiful. 
no doubt, but so were all the rest of the women who were gathered. I think that her greatest attribute may well have been that she was, on the night she was summoned to spend with Alcheshverosh, the king, she did nothing to encourage his advances. In fact, what she said was no. Where all the other candidates threw themselves at him, she said no. Her refusal actually made her very attractive. It also gave her an air of dignity and refinement. The king may have been a barbarian, but he was searching for a queen, a mother to rear his heir. He was wise enough to see that Esther's inner beauty far outshined any of the other women. It wasn't even a contest. That didn't stop Akashverosh from having relations with her. She just didn't readily participate. So according to Jewish law, if a married woman is raped, she can still remain married to her husband. So the marriage that existed between Mordechai and Esther was still viable. However, now that she was going to Akashverosh to plead for the life of her people, now she was going to give herself over to Akashverosh willingly. An act that would forever sever the marital bond between herself and Mordechai. An act of spiritual suicide. So another reason for the double turn was that she felt that Akashverosh may well kill her in this life and or giving herself over to a non-Jew may also cause her to lose her portion in the next life, i.e., double expression. So not only did she succeed in saving her people from genocide, she did so in a way that helped to turn the sin into a merit, what we call tshuva me'ahava, repentance out of love. The people had sinned with the party with wine, and so now she orchestrated a drinking party with Haman and the king, using the instrument of their transgression as the instrument in their salvation, giving the nation additional merits necessary to be able to overcome the evil Haman. She was even able to go back all the way to the beginning of time. She was able to correct the sin of Chava, first woman, who gave Adam to drink from the grapes that she had squeezed from the tree of knowledge. With that sin, Chava brought death into the world. And now, with Esther giving Haman and Akashverosh a drink at her party, she was now able to bring life to the whole Jewish nation. Because she brought life to the nation at the risk of her own life, God blessed her. That shortly after this story, she became pregnant and bore a son to Akashverosh. She no longer had a worry for her life. Her future was secure. This son would be the one to give the Jews permission to build the second temple. In addition, he donated food and materials for those who were involved in its construction. So the second temple, which stood for 420 years, was the direct results of the actions of Esther and her willingness to do whatever it took to save her people. This temple, that temple stood for 420 years in her merit. As I mentioned before, we find in the Talmud and Tractate of Yuma, the Reb Meir said that when a parent's given <clears throat> name to their newborn child, it's done with a touch of prophecy, an inspiration from heaven, not an accident. However, the names Esther and Mordecai are both Persian names. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah, meaning rose. The gematria of the name is 74, the same as the gematria of the Hebrew words, the aviv the imo, with a father and a mother. Mordecai may have well chosen that name, since Esther was orphaned from both her father and her mother at birth. There may well have been a much deeper sim symbolism to the numerical value of 74. In Hebrew letters, the letter Ayin and Dalit are 74. Together they spell the word Da, to know, and the, and the other way backwards is Aid, testify. She would reach the point in her life where she would be able to reach the spiritual plateau of knowing and testifying that there is a God in the world, and that she was willing to give her life up for his honor. This, of course, connects with the holiest prayer that we say twice each day, the only prayer that we say that is of a Torahic obligation, the Shema Yisrael. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is your God, the Lord is one. In that prayer, the third letter, the Ayin, and the last letter, the Dalit, are both enlarged. 
We too testify every day to the act of self-sacrifice that Esther was willing to bear in the name of her God and for her people. We all carry that same gene. The gematria of the name Esther is 661. That's, this number has great spiritual significance. We know that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, wore a garment called an aphod, a sort of apron. It was fastened with straps on each shoulder. On these straps were attached an onyx stone. Engraved on these stones were the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Six tribes were inscribed, inscribed on each of the stones, six on one shoulder and six on the other. The high priest alluded to by the number one, standing in the middle, carrying the tribes on his shoulders, bringing them together as one nation before the one God. Through her actions, Esther was able to reach the spiritual level of the high priest on Yom Kippur. He was the only person worthy enough to enter into the Holy of Holies, the holiest place on earth, to pray for the safety and success of the whole nation. This, too, became her mission. She began the story concerned about me, herself, her life. However, in the end, she was able to turn the me into we. Her concerns were no longer for herself. Her thoughts and actions were only about the survival of the Jewish nation. This was an unusual time in that it is at the only time in history, world history, that all the Jews lived under the dominion of one foreign ruler. This has never been the case before or after, again, in all of world history. When God scattered us all to the four corners of the earth, in reality, he actually assured our survival. As we have seen, whatever happens to the Jews in one part of the world does not necessarily affect their brethren who reside on the other side of the world. We see a connection between the Jews receiving the Torah and the holiday of Purim. Throughout most of our history, we have been a divided and argumentative nation. However, only twice, only twice in our history, we were completely united. Once, at the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, and the second time, during the holiday of Purim. We express that unity even today, by fulfilling the rabbinic command to shlok monos ish areo, by sending gifts one man to his friend, and matanos la aniyim, and by giving charity freely to the poor. The third expression of peace and unity will come with the coming of Mashiach may come quickly and in our time. So how does the story conclude? Just like we read with the death of Sarah, our mother, though her life was filled with challenges and difficulties, all's well that ends well. Sarah's end was fulfilled with happiness and joy. And so too with Esther. Shortly after the story of Purim, Achishverosh dies, and their son Darius takes over as king. Esther sacrificed herself both physically and spiritually for her people. She thought that she would be forced to live with Achishverosh for many years, but God freed her from her subjugation. She had fulfilled her mission, but still, she put her life on the line for her God and her people. What was her reward? And I think the greatest reward of all. Think of it. How would someone feel if they knew that because of them, because of their sacrifice, no Jews would have died in the Holocaust? That would be a reward that would last for 10 lifetimes. One woman managed to save her whole nation from total annihilation. We would not be here today, any of us, if not for the sacrifice that she made. Is there any greater reward than that? You know, nothing's an accident. Today, I was studying and I saw the words, Or Haman, cursed is Haman, and Baruch Mordechai, blessed is Mordechai, have the exact same gematria, 502. This is a world of free will for every good, in the, world, in the world, there is an evil that challenges it. 502 on both sides. The power of one, one God, one people, one land, one Torah, one woman, one purpose. We have one mission, to serve the one and only God in the world and to bring the one and only Messiah in the world. May he come quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Have a great day. 
Freilich of Purim and a terrific Shabbat. And again, God bless and thank you for listening. Be safe, be happy, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you.